Nicola Sturgeon, you are the first First Minister anywhere in the world to open a flush fest, so thank you very <laughs> much indeed. That makes me feel quite nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was a teenager growing up, I had absolutely no idea uh, what the menopause was. Had I had an idea and had I known my mother was going through an early menopause at 46, I wouldn't have been such a horrific teenager. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I believe that. Do, <laughs> did you know anything about it no. growing up? Was it ever discussed in your house? No, never, ever. I don't remember any discussion about the menopause uh, when I was a teenager. But actually, fast forward a few decades to my 30s, probably well into my 40s, I would have been completely ignorant about not what it was, obviously I knew that, but what the symptoms were, how to deal with them, what exactly to expect. So yeah, it's something that is such a mystery, even now to most women. And did your mum ever indicate to you that she was going through the menopause, you know, irritable, not sleeping, anything like that as you were growing up? Not, were you away from home by then? Uh, so yeah, I was away from home by the time my mum was going through that. She, she never openly or explicitly refer to it. Looking back on it, I can absolutely mm -hmm. recognise what she was going through. But at the time, I guess like most women of her generation, she thought she had to hide it and, you know, sort of keep it away from view and so wouldn't talk about it even to me uh, or I'm sure to most other people around her. Or even to a doctor. I mean, that's the thing. I think women did hide yeah, it. Yeah. And in fact, there wasn't even this idea 30 years ago that there was a proper treatment for some, obviously treatments only suit some, mm. but that there was somewhere that she could go. Yeah, I, I don't know, I've not asked her, I must ask her actually you if, she ask did, her. if she did go to see her GP, but I suspect not, uh, because you know she wouldn't necessarily have known that was an option. Actually, some women I speak to today still don't really know that there is help available and that they can go and get you know advice, treatment, whatever. No, well, funny enough, I just got the call the other day to, to come for my annual to the surgery to get my blood pressure checked, uh, check an HRT, and thank goodness now we can get oestrogel again. It's been out the mm. pharmacies, it's been terrible. Yeah, People yeah. have been really mm -hmm. terrified about what mm -hmm. to do and whether to substitute. Mm -hmm. So so much that's still not known. And of course, HRT isn't for everyone. No, it's not for everyone. And I, I grew up, um, I guess, during the, the years when there was a lot of fear about HRT, the, the breast cancer scare, which of course then turned out to have been exaggerated. So I remember, you know, to the extent I did think about this in my 20s, I was very, very firmly of the view, HRT, no way, never, the menopause, when it eventually comes and it felt so far away in the future, it's something you just have to sort of power your way through. And I'm glad I have a completely different view of that now, <laughs> very glad I've got a different view of that now. But you, you wonder how many women uh, of, of my generation previous generations and even now are suffering unnecessarily because of that fear that was instilled in us about HRT. Yes, and also the fear that was instilled about HRT, but also this whole idea of vulnerability, never to be vulnerable. We've just got, you know, it seems like recently got the legislation, all sorts of legislation that puts women in a position where they can actually go on in their careers and you know, no sex discrimination, yep. you know, equality and fairness and all that. And so they don't want to seem to be weak. And there's this still this notion mm -hmm. that uh, to show weakness is bad. And yet, when I did the documentary, one of the women I interviewed was head of all nursing services at Queen Elizabeth. And she had red mist. That horrible feeling of just tension and not being able to hold on and hold in your yeah. anger. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder, because every, everybody's, you know, everybody's experience is deeply personal, but I hadn't any idea, and I don't know if you had any idea five years ago even, the, the variety of symptoms, mm -hmm. physical and mental. Oh, absolutely, and, and I'm still not sure I completely understand that. So speaking personally, that's exactly what I started to suffer, the sort of you know, hotness and just general feeling of, of discomfort, not being able to sleep. The lack of sleep was horrendous. Um, and just that sense of not feeling yourself all of a sudden, that you know, sense of anxiety, sort of you're know, having to suppress a bit of rage <laughs> at the world all of the time. And I suppose for me, um, and many women will be the same actually, that sort of, is what I'm experiencing here menopause or is it just the sort of symptoms of stress that come with doing a job like, like yours. I do? And trying to distinguish between the two w was really difficult. But that, that sense of uh, vulnerability and weakness and so many women don't want to show that in a job like mine, 
part of what I started to experience and part of the anxiety was about, you know, if I start to have any of these symptoms, brain fog, you know, memory loss. Flushing. Flushing, or if, and definitely if I start to talk about them and be open about them, you know, people are going to say, she, she can't do her job. She's incapable of doing the job she's doing, which is not true for women in any job, of course, but there's a real fear about that. You know, I, I used to get really, really anxious about what if I'm standing up in parliament and suddenly I have a hot flush or I just forget well, <laughs> the next sentence well, that I'm supposed to say. Exactly. And what do I do? Well, that's, that's so funny you should say that because, you know, I even now, you know, I've interviewed you lots mm -hmm. of times. I've got your name at the top of the page. When I do news now, I've got the name mm, at the top yeah. of the page because that thing of maybe just at that minute, yeah. you'll forget. Yeah. And I, I have that just now in Parliament and I, I'm not sure whether it is it is an actual real symptom of the menopause or whether it is anxiety induced. I'll be mid-sentence and then I'll suddenly find myself thinking, do I, do I know the word that I'm uh -huh. about to say here or am I going to forget it? And it's, it's when you're on your feet and, that, and the, you know, the cameras are on you, it's been, you know, they're recorded for posterity and it's, it's terrifying in, in some moments. But wouldn't it be great wouldn't it be great if you're doing that, you're you know, doing FMQs or you're doing whatever, and you just say, do you know what? I'm going to take a minute. Well, you know the Scottish media as well as I do. Yes. Um, but then we can shame them, presumably, well, yeah. if you were then shamed but for this taking is a minute. Where, and I'm not having a go at, at, at Scottish journalists here because uh, there's, I can understand why they might think I am, and, and I'm not, but it does bring home some of the remaining gender imbalances that we have. So you know this, when I'm standing in the Scottish Parliament, if I look up to the press gallery, it's male dominated. Mm -hmm. Now, one or two women there, but largely men who, if I was to do that, I'm not sure the immediate reaction would be anything other than, oh, she's lost the plot, she's, you know, she's yeah, losing it, she's not capable. But I think, you know, maybe two or three years ago even, that might have been that. But actually, I think these people would be very foolish to do that in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, menopause isn't a choice. No, I yeah, And if men went through the menopause, yeah. believe me, we'd have had a lot more Well, we sympathy. wouldn't have had the shortages and, you know, the supply issues. And, you know, we'd have much more. We'd probably find a cure for it by now <laughs> in some ways. Yeah, so. No, but the thing is, it isn't a choice. And therefore, it's part of society. We are the majority in society. Why is it so difficult? Because I was just looking up actually something, it was a CNN commentator 2015 and talking about uh, a woman in the White House and said, isn't there a real problem there? Because, you know, uh, you know, what if there was the need to decide on the nuclear button? As if a hormonal woman yeah. would make the wrong decision just because she's, got, uh, she's going through the menopause. So therefore that suddenly bars her in some yeah, way from first yeah, office. It's, yeah, it's absolutely ridiculous. But I think it's, I mean, you, you take, take the menopause out of it for a second. Women always have to prove themselves much more. So you're immediately in the society we live in, starting from the point of view of people thinking that because you're a woman, you're not quite as up to doing these jobs as, as men are. So you're, you're already trying to, prove that you're better than the average man, which let's face it, it's not that difficult. <laughs> then you add in the menopause and you can understand, I absolutely understand why there's a real reticence mm -hmm. in, in talking about it and in admitting that vulnerability. But unless we do start to talk, and one of the reasons I've decided to talk about it and it's not, it's not comfortable or, you know, it doesn't feel natural to do, is that if people like me don't start talking about it, we never bust this stigma. And have you uh, just been dealing with it on your own or have you actually talked to your GP? I've talked to my GP, so I'm now taking HRT um, for the last four months, which I think is Has helping. it kicked in yet? Yeah, I think it is starting to kick in, yeah. Um, I've not been as rage fueled. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sleeping better? I'm sleeping better. That's the That's main the key thing, difference it? it's making because the lack of sleep. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't sleep brilliantly and, you know, there's lots of things in day-to-day -day life that can keep me awake at night, but um, yeah, I'm sleeping better. It's so funny, actually, now when I think back uh, to Margaret Thatcher saying that she dealt with uh, the job on five hours sleep, she was probably menopausal, yeah. actually. I often think, and this is one of the reasons why I'm talking about it, there's nobody, I mean, there's very few women who've been in the you know, top positions in politics, but there's, of those who have been, you know, if you think about Angela Merkel, you know, Hillary Clinton, Thatcher, they must all have Our gone through this. Yep, they must all have gone through this, and yet I can't find anybody 
that has spoken about it. Mm. And, and that would help me, I think, if I could go and hear or, or read somebody mm -hmm. who had the same kind of anxieties that I have about the very public nature of the job. Well, this series of Borgen, Yes. <laughs> this year's about menopause is yeah. very much on the agenda and I suppose through drama in a way if you're not yeah. going to get people that are you know prime ministers or head of the European Union or whatever talking about it. I mean it's great you are talking about it now because you know there are a whole raft of women mm. you know New Zealand Finland of course the Baltic states the, the, the first minister is so young but it doesn't mean they're not going that through menopause. That makes me feel great. <laughs> But it's not that they're not going through menopause. We don't know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, but, I'm but I mean, Borg and I, I've, I've only seen the first couple of episodes of the new series, but it, you know, in the first episode, she has a whole flush. Yeah. You know, and and so it really it really helps, I think, just to normalise it, and the the mystique and the mystery and the, the just you know it's impenetrable some of it, yeah. and I find that you know I'm I'm the kind of person that if I want to know something, I just go and read everything I can find. And with the menopause, what I started to feel was that the more I read, the more confused yeah. I started to get. Yeah. And, and we need to sort all of that. Well, you see, we've got the most wonderful woman in Scotland, Heather Curry, mm. who is just, she, you know, she's the person to go to. And I'm just going to take a question. Before mm. I do, my one bugbear at the moment, though, is the commodification of the menopause. No sooner have we started talking about it than there's menopause shampoo. And that is... That, nonsense it's putting women to expense yeah yep. doesn't make you sleep better at night because you've got using menopause shampoo in your head mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> well, I, I didn't know you could get menopause shampoo <laughs> you can't entirely sure what it is well no, i'm not sure what it is either um so here we go here's a question from hazel from exeter in devon how do we create a culture of empowerment and positive education for women approaching the perimenopause rather than simply waiting until it happens and we're possibly hit with a wave of symptoms that no one seems to understand or to know what to do. How do we get ahead? So I think it is about being more open talking about it, but it is also, I think, about exposing young girls and young boys mm -hmm. to it much earlier on. So it should become part of how we talk about life and the way that you know, young girls will learn about periods and mm -hmm. fertility we should also be educating them about this stage of life and okay it will seem very far in the future and unreal but it, it's all about normalising it and then for those of us approaching it or going through it being able to talk about it much more o openly. I, I think the big thing right now is that it is so shrouded even now in mystery and stigma. Yeah but it's funny actually because that whole idea of ageing anyway mm. is so gendered Absolutely. response to it and um, and then when you think actually when you think about um, the way that we learn about women who are older as being kind of done you know so um, some of the, the br most brilliant characters in literature you know like uh, Grace Poole, mm. Mrs Danvers, mm. um, um, Miss Havisham mm. these are these older women that they're somehow yeah but done. we internalize that as well we all, because society has has taught us to and I think that's part of the vulnerability and the weakness you've, you because you feel yourself it is a sign of weakness yeah. that you're going through this thing that as you said a moment ago everybody goes through it's not a choice it's not voluntary it's a stage of life and yet we feel that it is it is weakness and is demonstrating somehow that we're no longer as capable as we once were. So here's another question now um, here is from Shona from Maidens in Ayrshire one of the biggest things for women, particularly in the workplace, is brain fog and memory loss. Do either Nicola or Chrissy have any tips of how they keep on top of the game, especially when they forget a word, which I'm thinking must happen? Well, we sort of talked about that, but you know, what do you do now at the dispatch box? Do you make sure that the night before you've just had a very good sleep before you do FM's cues? Um, it's not always that simple, so no. I can't always control these things. I think what I've learned to do is just try not to, to sort of panic about it. And I've not done, and I've not had to do what you suggested I did, and maybe I will someday, of, of actually you know, openly just saying, I'm going to take a moment here. But I suppose knowing you can do that, um, I, I definitely write things mm -hmm. down on a piece of paper in front of me now more than I would have done before, because um, I would just have relied on memory and, uh, and, and brain power to, to do that. So there's, there's little tricks, I suppose, that you can use. But I, I think not to get overly anxious about it is the key for yeah. me. I suppose that um, what I do is, if possible, um, I get exercise. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not a runner, but I try and walk and so forth. And then I always try and tell myself that, you know, if I'm, I mean, it's different for you, you're first minister. If I make a mistake, it's not good, but I'm not a brain surgeon, so I won't kill somebody. Mm -hmm. 
I sort of think I've got to get in perspective mm -hmm. because you do get hit up. Yeah, I also think it's it's important to not always think about it as it will lead you to make mistakes. No, um, true. And, and so I think it's in talking about it, it's important that. I, well, I feel it's important that I don't contribute to this sense of, oh my God, it's awful and it, it makes you incapable of... So what I find is it makes it takes more of a toll on me yeah. to get things right and take decisions, but it doesn't mean those decisions are, are any less no. good or, you know, I make mistakes, everybody makes mistakes in the normal course of life. Um, so it, I find it just, it puts more, a bit more pressure on me to, to get to the the things and do the things in my job that I need to do. It doesn't, it doesn't influence the quality of what I'm doing. No, but in a way, the, the very fact of, um, as it were, ridiculously word, admitting to it and talking about mm. it and realizing we are going through it and actually you will see from your colleagues and your friends around you that other people are going yep. through it. Mm -hmm. That in a sense itself yep. reduces mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. stress about it. Absolutely. So that's a different thing because I would say that it is easier for women in senior positions to deal with it and say, look, I'm just going to do something. Mm -hmm. I'm going to step back. I'm not going to. I find it very difficult to think what it is like for just, for example, um, you know, a, a, a nurse overnight totally. working really hard mm -hmm. or an air traffic controller, mm -hmm. all, all these people mm -hmm. who, and, and for, for also for particularly for women working in male industries, mm -hmm. male led industries like construction, that, you know, it's very hard to say I'm going to step away. And I don't, I, you know, every, every single company, I assume you would agree, should have a policy on menopause. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that is improving. I think there is more awareness, more in the way of policies, you know, whether it's about, you know, women wearing uniforms, whether it is about just having the ability when you need it to take a bit of time away. I think it's a long way to go. But you're right. I really agree. It's, you know, it's not easy in jobs like mine or jobs like yours. But if you're on a 12 hour shift somewhere with no, you know, three breaks or something, I was talking to a friend recently who is a doctor and was saying earlier in her career, she's going through it now as well, earlier in her career doing 12 hour shifts when there was no getting away from what you were doing. And if she was doing that now, it would be you know, much, much more difficult. It would be. And also, you know, the, the, the problem is, I think that if you are also in a senior position, that your, your leadership skills are the thing that's meant to kind of drive you through. But part of your leadership skills are to say, Look, I can't do everything, mm -hmm. you know, but, but let's not, I mean, we're not talking about you know, the menopause as being so debilitating. And the thing is, I think that you just don't have a menopause. What we have to do is live with the menopause, because as far as I'm concerned, it's been going on for 20 years, in my case, because what, I you mean can, it doesn't end soon? No, it doesn't end soon, <laughs> sorry. I mean, it doesn't. Well, I mean, I mean, because because I had a sudden menopause when I had a hysterectomy and then I went on to HRT and came off it during the scare. I had these years until I, when I went back to my doctor at first, my doctor said, one of the doctors, and I do have a good practice, but one doctor said, I think you're just too old to go on HRT. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I went back again and said, wait, wait a minute here. Mm -hmm. And and it, it, it was life changing mm -hmm. in a way. I think the idea of not giving up, and I think the problem is that GPs are incredibly busy. Mm -hmm. And there has been a tradition um, of just giving women antidepressants. I never was offered, I wasn't offered that, but I know and when I was making the documentary that that was seen, low mood is something that yep, happens yep, in menopause mm -hmm. and women are just offered that. Yeah, I know, I mean, I've got friends and you know contacts who were in that position and who were offered and some who took antidepressants. And before I went to see my GP and I wasn't offered it, it was never a, a part of the conversation. No. That was one of the things I was really, really firm about. If that is offered, I am absolutely no. not going to even countenance it. And you just talked about uniform. Here's one, a question about that from Donna from Aberdeenshire. Does the requirement for women to wear a uniform officially or in compliance with the dress code affect her ability to cope with hot flushes? Obviously, well, obviously it isn't acceptable to whip off your clothing in public. <laughs> no, I should <laughs> well, not yet. Un underline no, that no, point. Not yet. <laughs> uh, but certain fabrics or styles of clothing are more comfortable for a lady of a certain age than others. Now, that is interesting. Yeah. I never thought of that, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some jobs and, and walks of life where uniform or certain standards of dress are, you know, appropriate and necessary. But different fabrics, different, you know, styles and designs, these are all things, as we said earlier on, if men went through the menopause, this would all be taken for granted. And I, you know, I don't have to wear a uniform at work, but I do a job where there is an expectation of a certain, you know, type and standard of dress. So yeah, there are days when I'm 
in a suit and you think, God, I wish I, wish I didn't have to do this. So, um, yeah, I, I just think these are all things we've got to normalise and build into, as you said a moment ago, this is a stage of life. It's not something you go through and it's suddenly over. It's a it's an adaptation you need to make and therefore society has to adapt to it as well. But also I think the interesting thing, I mean, if I think about you, I would say that um, even if you'd been going through an early menopause, which obviously, you know, you're not going through a very early menopause, not, um, you wouldn't necessarily have had the confidence to talk about this two or three years ago even. No, absolutely not. Um, that's a big change. Uh, absolutely not. And that's actually, again, I'm conscious of the fact that in talking about it, we've got to be careful we don't, I mean, it's, it brings lots of challenges and lots of issues for women, but we, we don't talk about it in a way that reinforces this sense that it is utterly debilitating and it's awful and there is an upside as well to I don't know if it's an upside yeah. to the menopause there's an upside to this stage in life where Completely. you do menopause can reduce women's confidence but I think getting to this stage in life also gives you a different kind of confidence which is less you know and I'm, not, I'm not good to say in the way which would involve uh, involve swearing but you know effort a little bit and just say what you think and, and who cares what other people think well and, and and exactly and before you know 50 years ago you should be talking she's a mad old bat now but now you actually there understand. are probably plenty of people out there who still <laughs> say that about me but you know, but, you know one of the upsides of the menopause is no more periods frankly yeah mm -hmm. you know because you know Absolutely. women and girls go through Absolutely. all these in fact there's just these stages of life that are very tricky mm -hmm. for women mm -hmm. and so we've, you know that you get through the other side of that Absolutely and there is a liberating element Absolutely. to all of this and I think it's really important that in in talking about it we we don't lose sight of that there are aspects of this that are are good because they are about freeing yourself from other things that perhaps weren't always great so here's uh, the final question we've got here. This is coming from uh, Leslie Percy from Litterborough in Greater Manchester. Um, what is the one thing that could be done in your view to improve care and awareness for menopausal women? So for me, um, and I'm speaking a bit personally here, it would be easier access to reliable, relevant information that, they, that allowed you as a, a woman to kind of have a better understanding of what you were going through, what was likely to happen, but also give you, I guess, a route map to where you can get advice and support. Um, I find one of the biggest issues is just the, I don't know, the wealth, because uh, there's a lot of information there right now, but it's often confusing, contradictory, difficult to access. So really clear, reliable information that then gives people the signposts as to where to go. There are, you know, the, now there's a plethora mm -hmm. of books, a plethora of things. Yeah. So what women want is kind of straightforward yeah. advice. I mean, my, I'm the type of person I will immediately go and find a book on something, yeah. but I've actually not found that particularly helpful. Some books have been good, but you know, you read one and then you read another and it's like, well, which one of these do I believe? So we, through the Scottish Government, the Women's Health Plan, uh, we're seeking to address that through easy to access information in one place and I think that's one of the most important things you can give people because then you can you can go into it and take what you need at the time you need it and it often then tells you where to go if you need more so that for me would make the biggest difference and of course you know we're talking primarily at the moment about women in their 40s upwards um, dealing with menopause but there are a number of young women mm. who go through menopause very early and for them there are all sorts of added complications yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, well, firstly, it's important to remember that it affects women of all ages. So it's not just women of, you know, 50 upwards. And I guess, obviously, I didn't experience that, but I think experiencing it much, much younger must be much, much harder because, of course, it you know brings all sorts of other things to the fore. There's less, even less of an understanding of that. Uh, somebody was telling me, I don't know what it is, that there's a storyline in one of the soap operas just now of somebody going through the menopause really young. So again, Which is I, great when it happens it, in the soap opera. Absolutely. So if, if that can be part of the conversation, then I think that will be really helpful to the, the women who go through it much younger. First Minister, thank you very much. Thank you.